Hi, my name is Marie and I am an alcoholic. And I want to start off by saying I have said those words thousands of times to groups of people with whom I share that condition. And for the first time in my career, I said it just about 10 years ago to a group of nurses in Texas. And when I shared that statement with my professional colleagues, I was there to do a, a conference on relationship-based care. And um, that was the first time that I, I said that to professional colleagues my worlds came together with a huge clash. And I saw things that I had never seen before. And I want to talk about those things that are issues within the nursing profession regarding substance use disorder. But in order to do that, I want to first of all tell you my story. I wanted to be a nurse since I was five years old. I've written about this and it's, I've talked about it for many years. Uh, a nurse, I was a patient at St. Joseph's Hospital, and a nurse came and called it in my coloring book. And in the situation I was in, and the way I was feeling abandoned by my parents and in pain and really scared, when she sat down and called it in my coloring book, something happened here. And I even had the feeling at that time that this was what my life was going to be about. And after that, I always knew I was going to be a nurse. When I was growing up, people would say, what are you going to do when you grow up, Marie? Oh, I'm going to be a nurse like Florence Marie Fisher, because that was the name of the nurse who called in my coloring book, Florence Marie Fisher. I never saw her again. I never heard from her. I never had a card exchanged with her. I never forgot her name. And it speaks in this context to the value I held for my profession. So I went right through. After high school, I, became a, I went to a diploma school, and I got my RN. I worked in the hospital for several years. Then I came to Minnesota, and I got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree. And in 15 years, let me do it this way, I got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree and an MRS degree, and two children and a career and a divorce, and, a, uh, and the career advancing all that time. In the middle of that 15 years, I was in this innovative process where we were developing a new way for nurses to take care of patients. That was very exciting for me, and I was experiencing high energy every day. I hated to leave work. It was just so much fun. But I had two children. I had a five-year-old and a one-year-old, and I needed to pick them up at the end of the day and we needed to go home, and I needed to be a mother. I needed to be a cook. I needed to be uh, a housewife and do the cleaning. And I had no energy. I would, and, I, and these children needed a mother, and I knew they needed a mother. And it wasn't that I ignored them, but I just, my heart just was not in it because I was completely drained of energy. And... The guilt that went along with that, I've come to understand almost every working mom to some degree or another feels that guilt. And I didn't know how to handle it. People then were talking a little bit about self-care. I didn't know what it meant. I thought it maybe meant an extra 15 minutes in a bubble bath, but that didn't appeal to me at all as a way to change the horrible feeling I had. What I found that did work, however, was a drink after dinner. And at that time, martinis were very popular, and that was my drink of choice. Now, I started on a 10-year span of drinking, which was a, a continuum uh, span. So it started, there's about three phases to it. started off with using alcohol, then abusing it, and finally being addicted to it. Now, I can recall some of those phases, and I also rem remember after the fact that I could see that I had crossed over a line, an invisible line. I think we don't talk much about this, but I don't think it's at all uncommon as a person is becoming addicted. 
the crossing over invisible line. So I started off with one drink when I got home from work, one martini, and everything was fine. It took away the guilt. I was able to give me energy. I was able to feel good about what I was doing. But after a while, and I remember saying to my husband, it's a wonderful thing about martinis, the one is just enough before dinner. And then after a while, I realized that two worked just as well, if not better, before dinner. And I remember again thinking, perhaps saying, um, this is really good before dinner, but there's no point in having it after dinner. And that went along for a period of months, and then one day I had one after dinner. And then I never, when I started with two, I never went back to one. When I started having a drink after dinner, I never stopped. I never went back to not having a drink after dinner. And so the evolution progressed, and eventually, um, I was I was recruited. By this time, my marriage was over. I was rec and I you know I always say people always ask me if it was because of drinking. I think not. I think it ended while we were still in the early phases of what later became my addiction. Um, but I was recruited to take a job at Yale New Haven Hospital. Now, I skipped a little bit here. There was a couple of years, three years there, four years, when I was chief nurse at Miller Hospital here in St. Paul, and, um, and uh, that merged into United Hospitals. So I was a director of nursing in an intense merger that was very challenging in many ways. When Yale New Haven Hospital started recruiting me, I was kind of glad to get out of the intense culture clash of the merger and get into a place that was all one hospital. Um, and I had, I had an understanding that I was running into a problem with alcohol and so I had gone to some meetings here in the St. Paul area. I had stopped drinking and was pretty much convincing myself that I wasn't a real alcoholic because I didn't have DTs or anything. I just stopped drinking for a while. And that was working well for me. I was doing well. I wasn't feeling any major craving. And during the recruitment process to Yale, I remember my CEO fellow who later became my CEO, saying to me, we're going to have a cocktail party for you at my house tonight. And all the chiefs are coming and the administrators and the board and so on. And then he said, I hope you like martinis as much as I do. I said, you bet I do. And that was it. By the time I actually moved there, I was off and running into deep addiction. I remember I had a bottle in my sleeping bag. Before the furniture came, we had the three of us slept in the sleeping bags in the den. And it really progressed and went into high, high use of alcohol. And towards the end, every night, I was drinking to black out or pass out. I was vice president of all the clinical services at Yale New Haven Hospital. That meant I had the eight departments of nursing. Every, each one was headed by a department head. I had, you know, uh, all the clinical services that touched the patient. Physical therapy, restaurants, there are very pharmacy, chaplains. Uh, I think it was a total of 18 departments at the time that I was the administrator of. And every fourth, every fifth night, there were five administrators, five vice presidents. Every fifth night, I was on call. And that meant, you know, I was the administrator that they called if they couldn't solve a problem or they didn't know what to do with the situation. But I was always in either blackout or pass out. Now, they're different. They're different. And blackout, you actually still have your same judgment capability, brain cell-wise. Uh, but you can't remember anything. Pass out is unconsciousness. So I would be in blackout when those calls came. And the highest terror I ever felt was when I would wake up in the morning, realize I had been in blackout. I couldn't remember anything from the night before. I couldn't remember if I had a call or not. Um, and there was no terror worse than going into the hospital, walking towards my office, seeing a doctor walk towards me, and having him say, 
Oh, by the way, about that call last night, Marie, I'm an absolute blank. And I just, everything was at risk in those moments. And I would get clever, you know, I'd say something like, uh, yeah, what do you think about that? <clears throat> Trying to find out from him what the circumstances had been. It was really awful, and I, and I knew it. Now, I want you to remember how much I love nursing. I could not not drink. I had a position that I considered one of the top in my field. I loved working there. People liked me. I had good PR and good press commentaries. I was often in the press for doing a seminar or something, and I could not not drink. And that was the only time I drank. I never went to work having had a drink. But my alcohol level, I'm sure, was at, towards the end quite high. I got a little bit bloated, and I knew that I was in trouble. I, I knew that I was clinically depressed, and I could not stop. So when the CEO and the CMO, chief executive officer and chief medical officer invited me to, to dinner at a country club, um, Quinnipiac Club, they asked me if I'd like a drink before dinner and I said, sure. And I was the only one that had a drink. And that was my last drink. It was June 26th, uh, 1978. And they that night said I had to go to treatment and I said outpatient. I was glad. I actually said, yes, I know I have trouble. Yes, I admitted that I was not able to stop drinking. And, but I was afraid to go, into inpa to go into inpatient because we were in the middle of a political issue regarding reorganizing administration. The chief financial guy and I were on one side. The other two and the CEO were on the other side. It was kind of a battle. And I didn't have anybody to take care of the kids. So for two reasons, I did not want to go into inpatient. But they said, if I went, you know, I said outpatient, they said inpatient. I said, they said, if I didn't go into inpatient, I would lose my job. So clearly that was motivation to go. And I did go. And they fired me while I was in treatment. So that solved the administrative conflict problem, of course. Uh, and it left me without a job very low severance uh, that they were willing to pay, and, and, and no hope of a job. I knew enough about the rumor mill in nursing that I knew that word would get out um, that, that I was an alcoholic and that positions would not be available. And a little known fact is that I was heavily recruited during those three years at Yale to go to Stanford as CNO, to go to Cedar Rev, Cedar Sinai, many big hospitals, and I would get those calls two or three times a week. And after I got out, about three years later, I got one call from a New York hospital, and I said to myself, "Well, New York always was behind times." <laughs> I just didn't know. <laughs> anyway, it was a very difficult time. Those next couple of years were really tough. I didn't know what to do. And I started doing just the next thing in front of me. And that meant I started writing the book, uh, The Practice of Primary Nursing. I didn't have a computer. I wrote it on yellow pads, longhand. And I began accepting every invitation to speak. After, and I started in AA. And there's, AA is very controversial, but there's a lot of things that need to be remembered, as people say. It's old fashioned and it doesn't work. It, it does work. There are always meetings in every community as much as anybody could ever want. And there's no charge and nobody cares who you are. And so for a lot of reasons, AA is always going to be available to help people. Um, and I began to develop um, a recovery program. And um, what happens in the recovery program is that you go through a transformational change and end up um, being able to live on a daily basis without some of the habits of thinking that drove those experiences before, um, before recovery. So the transformational process is amazing 
And as I've been privileged to work with hundreds of women who are going through that process. There is an interesting integration between developments in nursing and developments as a person that would be the subject for another, another program someday. But here's the problem with nursing, and I didn't discover this for so many years, I'm embarrassed to say it. When I realized what happened that day, I said, I am, my name is Marie, and I am an alcoholic in Texas when I said that. And those two worlds came together. It was an unbelievable experience for me because I knew then that what was happening within nursing was devastating to our profession. And I was embarrassed that I had not made that connection. And later I came to understand that it's because of the conspiracy of silence that, that governs the profession's dealing with people with any kind of addiction in nursing. The conspiracy of silence that keeps the shame and stigma so strong that it's as if we're throwing nurses under the bus. Other professions do a much better job of supporting the person who's got the addiction problem. Physicians, I'm talking about other licensed health professionals do a better job, generally speaking, than we do in nursing. I have spent um, a, a fair amount of time trying to understand what happens. And my conclusion is that we have an attitude in nursing that addiction is a moral failure and that it is shameful. And that is at the highest levels. We, add, we, 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 we believe that. If we understood it as a disease, much like diabetes that gets diagnosed, treated, and is managed then for the rest of the person's life, it would be an altogether different experience than it is to people who develop an addiction in this country, uh, <clears throat> in this profession. So I've been involved in uh, an innovation here in the state of Minnesota called the development of the Nursing Peer Support Network. And the reason is that it became clear to me that one of the services other professions have had is peer support. And we developed a 501c3 nonprofit that provides for meetings throughout the state of Minnesota for nurses to come together and talk to nurses about their experience, and that's what provides the healing for stigma and shame. Stigma comes from the outside, shame comes from the inside. They both are barriers to recovery. And the best, best way to deal with them is through peer support. It doesn't work as well to be a sponsor, to be a coach, to be a therapist, to be a counselor. All of those roles are not effective in helping nurses overcome the stigma and shame. But I think that the underlying cause of that stigma and shame remains <coughs> an insistent belief that we have that addiction is a moral failure. And I am on a one-woman campaign to do everything I can to wipe that notion away <coughs> and allow us to get to a mature understanding, an adult understanding of this as a chronic disease. So as I say, I've been on a one-woman campaign to change that deep-seated belief in nursing that it's a moral failure. And, and the other part of my campaign is to send out this message of hope and understanding that recovery is possible. I, mean, I am a classic example. Um, much of the work that I was recognized for in receiving the living legend of the Academy, American Academy of Nursing, took place while I was in recovery. And so recovery is an opportunity to become the person you best can possibly be. And I just want to encourage people to understand that. And it's worth the work to find out how to go through that transformation, get the help you need, get into recovery, and live a full and productive life. I have been so grateful for this life. I am grateful to be an alcoholic. <laughs>